you know, when we first did Sunny, it my the exercise was just to write something that I could shoot. So we wanted to make something short. So it wasn't even that it was a TV series. It was a, a short film, basically, just mm -hmm. about aw awful people. And I thought, I don't know, it'd be cool to do a, a comedy. So, so I wrote that, and that's what we shot. Robin noted to me that when he went to Montreal to see how Ubisoft, our partners, like how they actually made their video games, he was like, it's like a writer's room, except each writer has their own particular job, like so that the thing that they care about, their purview that they're always pushing. So you've got a monetization guy in the room that's always pushing his agenda and, and the designers only care about the design. And so that seemed really funny to me because there's already enough big egos clashing in a writer's room. Then you give everyone their specific purview that they're supposed to be doing and it just makes the conflict worse. So that was the way that I keyed into the show was like, oh, I, I know a show. I can write a show like that even though I didn't have any experience with the actual video game, you know, part of it. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that we were making it feel like it, it was, it, that it's familiar to people. So yes, they happen to be making a video game, but that's almost to the side or, or behind, in, in the same way that the characters on Sunny own a bar. We just wanted to make it so that, the, that it felt like people you recognized. of legendary heroes. One man will rise to take all of the credit. This game has something that no one else will. Me. It's just a person who is like, just so passionate about the thing that they're making almost to the point of killing themselves and everyone around them. Hey, can I get a coffee? I'm coming! Everybody has that game that they fell in love with because they make an impact. Those games were somebody's legacy. Well, this is my legacy. Our legacy. Our legacy, whatever. It's not my legacy. But what I love about the character of Ian, which wasn't necessarily pre present in my former boss, is that um, he ultimately, his ego is always humbled before the creative process. So he is just looking to make the best product possible. There's nothing else going into it. There's, it's not about like, you know, controlling his workers or anything like that. And yes, he might like, you know, like for the, in the pilot, Ian blusters through that whole thing and doesn't realize all the pain maybe that he's causing to Poppy. But in the end, he's admitting to her, like, I need you. I, mm -hmm. I recognize my own weakness. Um, and, and that you think that I'm this guy that thinks I made this whole thing by myself, but I know that I couldn't have done a single frame of it without you. And that like little bit of that one, episode I think buys that character so much. I could write the lyrics and the music and everything, but it would sound completely different without the drums. Wait, I'm Ringo? Well, yeah, of course you're Ringo. I mean, look, somebody's gotta keep the beat. Oh my God! You do need a big ego to get these things done. You know, you need somebody that's like, fuck it, I'm gonna make a new show and I'm gonna like push it through. But then you also need like the, the practical person um, that's like actually the nuts and bolts, like, well, how are you gonna do it though? Cause I know you say you'll do it and it'll be great, but like how, and what's step one? And why don't I cover that? And like, we should probably have some water or something, you know, like, <laughs> so you're thinking about that. The Zoom episode, just, I just wanna show a quick clip of it one that meant a lot to me. Yes! Fuck yeah! <laughs> did it! I did it! I did it! That came out of like <clears throat> real feelings that, you know, we had been discussing, but certainly that I was having because we did a week of production and then we shut down. And so I was like, not only gearing up for a long stint of work, but I was gearing up for like 12 hour days and just my entire life being put into this show. And then all of a sudden it was like, someone just yanked me out of it and threw me in my house and was like, you have nothing to do.
think your own thoughts. And I was like, oh no, that's going to be bad. So, so <clears throat> that was, a, that was definitely like the way that I felt. And, and honestly, the way that I felt after quarantine, the quarantine episode was done shooting because during the entire time we were shooting that from our houses, I was up at 5am every day. Rob would text me at like 505 and we would be like already talking. And then that thing ended. And it was just like this chasm of nothing in front of me. And so I was so pleased to see how people reacted to that. Um, you know, cause we definitely don't want to make Poppy a character that seems weak or not able to be as um, sort of as much of a boss and, and her own, um, you know, cool, awesome character as I am. So I was really delighted that people allowed us to make her so vulnerable and also they still love her and think she's a hero. And that was, that was great. It was a good restaurant. It was in West Hollywood. I was like, okay, I can pay my rent. And FX came to us and said, we want to do a pilot, but they paid, they didn't pay us enough money for me to quit my job. So I had to continue waiting tables. And then I took a week off. We did the pilot, went back to waiting tables again. And then we waited to hear if the show got picked up. And when, when they did pick it up, it was for six episodes. So it didn't feel like overwhelming, like, oh my God, now we don't know what we're going to do. We had already written three of the, of the scripts. Um, and so what they told us was, we'll let you make these six additional episodes, but we're not gonna pay you very much. Um, and so, uh, and, and they said, just the opportunity that, that you would have to like run this show the way you want and star in it with your friends. Um, it's, there's the opportunity cost is that there's not gonna be a lot of upfront money, but you can own a large chunk of it. Should it be successful, then it'll work out for you which was great because it actually lowered the stakes for us because we didn't feel like we were gonna mess anything up. They were barely paying attention to us. So we made the season, I went back to waiting tables and then we just kind of waited and waited to see. Coming to this as far as story in a, in a show that never takes anything seriously, getting to this moment. Yeah. Um... So being a fan of Sonny, uh, as I have said that I was since the very beginning, um, the, the premise of the show was always that the characters never grew or changed or um, learned their lessons at all. So this was really scary when Rob brought this up into the room that he had this idea to do this sort of coming out um, dance that would be played seriously and that we wouldn't undercut. Um, there was an episode that they did a while ago that was like the gang um, goes to their high school reunion and they did this whole dance sequence, but then they undercut it by showing you what they actually looked like dancing, which was terrible. And so uh, Rob's idea was to do something very earnest and just like have this beautiful dance, which was this true expression of sort of his character's struggle with his own sexuality. And it was a little bit terrifying, I've got to say, like being in the room because um, <clears throat> the show had never done that before. Um, but I think, you know, with when you do something for 12, 13 years, although the, there he is. I was just talking about your your dance. I can hear. Um, wow, I can hear. It. Okay, um, but I think the idea is that maybe the characters don't grow and change, but the um, but the uh, creators certainly have and do. And I think it's brilliant that at a show at this far into its run, it says like you don't get to say what we can, what our episodes look like, and what we can do with them. And the audience seemed to go along. They they loved this um, ending. I think it was beautiful um so it's I'll it's yeah about. it's beautiful it's poetic it it's unexpected it's it still fits you know it's it, it was right it just felt right for the character but like i i don't think anyone ever saw this coming rob can you talk more about the inspiration for this and the i'd say i don't know the, the bravery to 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 attempt something like this we're just always trying to do something unexpected and something different and something that you that you wouldn't expect from a television show. Um, and so with a show like Sunny, where we've been doing so many different kinds of things for so many years, um, um, you know, this kind of storytelling is just not something that you would expect. And so um, it's also like at a point where we're all at a point in our, our lives and careers where we want to stretch and learn and do different things and, and, um, and take this as an opportunity and a platform 
to to grow as people, if not as Meg said earlier, like as characters are never really going to change very much or learn anything or grow. And that's the point of the show. But we we certainly are. And so it gives us an opportunity to to express ourselves in, in different ways. So for me, the the, the end result was uh, it turned out pretty great, but like the process of getting there was just as much fun. It took months and months and months and months for me to learn how to do this um, for like what amounted to be a three minute sequence. And to me that it's like a perfect distillation to in, in, into like what the process of making a television show is, which is the end result is ultimately meaningless. And it's just about the, the, the process through which you got there because that's your life. My life is not that. My life is the process leading up to that. You know, I think that there's a real fear that we won't be able to like joke again about everything, but I also feel like maybe some of that is that every new generation gets to decide what they find funny. Funny is subjective always. Rob has told this story many times that one of the greatest things he ever heard from Danny DeVito was when they started working with him, they, you know, they were about to shoot a scene together and Danny said, okay, how do you want me to say this line? And Rob was like, well, you're Danny DeVito, you're a comic legend, you can say it however you want to. And he's like, no, I wanna know how you want me to say it because you're, this is your thing, you're funny. You're telling me what funny is. And like, I think if we can all stay open as creators especially like comedic creators to maybe the thing you used to think funny was super funny maybe the next generation isn't finding it funny anymore and instead of demonizing them and saying you can't take a joke maybe we need to figure out why they're not finding it funny and maybe that's because it seems like you've been punching down for a long time and and they they weren't raised to find that as hilarious as we did in the 80s or 90s of making fun of like the dork you know and so i i try to open myself up to it and say okay will you show me what's funny now and it's difficult because what they've said is funny as TikTok and I don't get it. So I, you I know, either. I'm yeah. I'm scared. Um, but the one thing that I do know that will always be relevant, that will always be needed are good stories. So instead of focusing on what we can and cannot joke about, I just try to focus on the stories and know that like the jokes will come and like we will be able to make it funny. But if you tell a compelling story about a character, you can do jokes that are a little on the line um, and people will follow you. Like for instance, in Everlight, just to talk about one thing in absolutely specific there's a there's a moment where they're in the middle of a fight and um and one of the characters joe is about to um strike down dana and she says die lesbian and then one of the other characters is like oh wow that's some hate crime territory you can't really say that and she says die bitch and they're like no that's misogynist and then just die and then she finally gets to do it and the funny thing about that joke was like people could have been offended that we wrote the words die lesbian into a script but but ultimately, like what was funny about that moment was that they, they were taking this moment to try to get the right language. They weren't opposed to her killing somebody, but let's not demean them while you kill them. And I, that to me is is funny. And like if if I if young kids find that stuff funny too, then then great. We're gonna be we're gonna be just fine. So I always think that there's a way to do it, you know. Um, but it, it starts with not assuming that you know everything just because you've been in the business for like a little while.